All right. Welcome to an Enviro House webinar. Today's topic is electric vehicles. Has their time come? We have Sarah Sweet from Tacoma Power with us today. And we have, uh, as always, Janda, the Enviro House expert. Um, as you get signed in here, you're going to notice that you are currently muted and your video is off. We are recording this, so we just want to make sure that everyone is, you know, safe and whatnot. So you'll notice there's different ways you can communicate with us. You can talk to us through the chat or the Q&A feature. And those are places I'll be monitoring during this. So you can always ask a question. And if you'll notice there's a panel that says to all panelists or and attendees, you can sit, just put all panelists and attendees. That way everyone can see your comment. And there's another thing you can do and that's, um, I'm gonna put up polls today. Like today I'm gonna show you, I'll start with a poll where you can vote. And you'll see this poll and I'll go ahead and set it up. Today's first question is, how did you hear about our workshop today? Was it Facebook, social media, Enviro News email list, Enviro House workshop website, workplace email, friend or family TPU events webpage, or maybe you saw me at the store and I told you to tune in. So go ahead and vote there. We'll give you about, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds. Uh, why don't I let Janda jump on in here and you can say hello. Okay, hello, good afternoon, and welcome to our last webinar of this year. Um, we will be starting again probably in February for the next round. It looks like we're going to be working from home for a while longer. Um, so we will be um, continuing the webinars, and if you have particular topics that you are interested in, please let us know. Um, particularly those that we've done in past workshops that we would be repeating. Um, Gator will post at some point here in the chat. He will give you um, the links for us to our um, EnviroHouse workshop page, which has previously recorded webinars listed. And um, there's also the how-to link for the videos that we've done. There are, I think, about 25 on there now on different how-to topics, um, how to make a rain barrel, how to do different kinds of gardening things. So you may be interested in those. Um, so for today, uh, Sarah is going to take us through the latest information on electric vehicles. And um, she's been doing this for us for a while. Um, so she's got this down pretty good. Um, Sarah Sweet from Tacoma Power and she will um, lead you on with the rest of us. So, Sarah? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Janda. Um, as Janda said, I am with Tacoma Power. I work in the Energy Research and Development Group. Um, I do have a background in environmental sciences. I like to let people know that um, because I am at heart a hippie, care about the environment, and I also care about being really practical. So, and I am an EV driver myself. So throughout this, I will mention little practical things or tips or things that I've noticed as well. And I feel like I should change the name of this to uh, electric vehicles, their time has come, especially with all of the new models coming out. All right, so our first poll, like to kick it off with where are you in your EV journey? It does help me kind of um, see where I should guide the conversation a little bit. Um, maybe if you have any, and if you have any specific questions or things that you would like to learn today, feel free to throw it in the chat, um, as well as if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, throw it in the chat. And Gator, as always, you have full permission to interrupt me with a question. I prefer this to be more of a discussion rather than just me, just me being a talking head. So feel free to throw in things and we'll have a chat. A little bit of humanity in this time and this day yes. and age, right? Um, I was just going to jump in and tell you that, you know, put up the poll here, electric, currently owned, currently own a hybrid or an electric. Uh, looks like we have uh, our our attendees are saying I'm interested in buying an electric vehicle in the next one to two years. That's kind of where I am personally. Also, I have one for work, which is great, which is actually sitting dead for the past few months. I believe. So. <laughs> but what can I do? I'm not there driving. So. so let's take a look at the results here. All right. All right. One to two years. Perfect. This is a great place to start then. All right, so first thing, 
it's a bit of a misnomer that electric vehicles are a new technology. They're really not a new technology. They've been around a long time. Um, so these are some of my favorite ads from electric vehicles. I love the Baker Electric, the silent car. And they mention in here, you can't really see the print small, but it says eliminates chain and chain troubles. And I love that because that's actually one of the same selling points as EVs today. Of course, cars don't have chains, but EVs have less moving parts. They have about a 10th of the moving parts of a gas vehicle. So there's less stuff to break and it's really, really quiet because you're not burning gasoline uh, to run that motor. I, and I do have a question sure. about the silent part. Yes. Now I've, I've heard, and this could be internet lore, that they put engine sounds in cars and other countries because they're so quiet. Like I'm pretty observant, but sometimes I don't hear them coming. So is that something they're doing now or what's the? I have read that as well. And to be honest, I'm not sure if it's an urban myth or not, but I do notice um, an electric car makes like this high pitched kind of whine when you're going at low speed. Um, and then at high speed, you don't hear that, that goes away. So I, and I've heard that they've added that sound to kind of warn pedestrians when you're driving around like a parking lot. That's why it's at low speeds so that they know someone's coming. But I have noticed when I first got my car, like people would just walk, like just totally unaware in front of my car. And sometimes I'd have to give them a little beep and they look really surprised. Like they didn't know there was sure. a car behind them. We could so, put uh, baseball cards in the spokes maybe. Yeah. That? The brrr, right? that <laughs> I, I saw, um, oh, I wish I could remember the name of it. There's, there's this YouTube channel that's a team of people that like to just soup up electric cars and do all kinds of crazy things with them. And they were getting a car ready for this race that it's a switchback race way up in the mountains. And interestingly enough, fun side fact to that, the electric vehicles do better in that race for a couple reasons. One, at the higher altitude, doesn't matter that the air is thin because they don't need that air for a fuel mix like gas cars do because there's nothing they're combusting. And two, they have 100% torque when you hit that accelerator, whereas gas cars need time to spin up. So they come out of a hairpin turn and just shoot forward. So it's really cool to watch this. But so what my point was, um, this group, they put in cat meowing sounds. So, cause it didn't make engine noise. And I think there was, I, if I recall correctly, there was like some kind of rule because there's so many spectators for this race that it, it like, they're like, you have to make noise. So they're like, okay, we'll, we'll have this cat meowing. So it's this electric race car going meow, meow, meow. <laughs> hilarious. My kids um, would love that actually. <laughs> yeah, I should oh. try to find them. Yeah. I'll look that up. Carry on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, anyways, but yeah, I should look that up and see if that's an urban myth or not the sound, but I, I think that's real. Um, so I was saying, er, so Henry Ford, he knew that electric cars were the future. Um, and he said, I believe that electric automobile will be the family carriage of the future. So he knew back in 1914. So now why drive an EV? There's, I think the big one, most people are drawn to first, there's no tailpipe emissions. Um, it's not burning anything, it's just electric. And something a lot of people don't know, it's actually far less expensive to fuel and maintain a gas, a, a electric car. Um, we already talked about the maintenance, there's less parts, I'll get more into that. But there, the fuel is cheaper too. And I'll give you some examples a little later. And on top of that, they are really fast, and they're fun. So I mentioned you get instant torque. You just shoot forward, really easy to merge on the freeway in these. Um, and they're quiet, but you don't have this engine noise. It's funny now when I when I am in a gas car, I seem I always think there's something wrong with it because it's so loud and I'm so used to my car now. I'm like, oh, it feels really rumbly and it's really loud. Is anything wrong? And everyone's always looking at me like I'm crazy. So gas cars, by, uh, by on the other side of the coin, they do emit greenhouse gas emissions, which do exacerbate climate change. They're inefficient and really expensive to operate. So, uh, you know, we're, we're creating many explosions in an engine to make the pistons move. And so a lot of that energy is wasted with heat because you're burning it. So tons of the energy is wasted with heat. It's like over half, it's crazy. Um, there's runoffs and pollutants and waterways, so transmission fluid, oil, 
uh, I was actually going to walk with my son this uh, during lunch today with the dogs and my son went, oh, look, a rainbow on the ground. I was like, oh, that's actually oil. And then he got really sad. So you don't have any of that with an electric vehicle. And the, the fuel source for gas vehicles can, can represent a national security issue. There, I mean, most of our oil comes from foreign sources. So we're a lot of times at the mercy of OPEC prices and you know, with electricity, it has to be locally produced. <laughs> you, you can't outsource electricity, it has to be produced here. So it's locally made, local jobs. So there's that to think about as well. And not only that, but greenhouse gas emissions, the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Tacoma are from transportation. That goes for Pierce County as well, particularly here in the Northwest because our electricity is so clean. I'll get into that a little bit too. So today, there I'll be talking about battery electric vehicles, but there are different types of electric vehicles. There's the battery electric, so BEV. There's the plug-in hybrid vehicle. So this has an electric motor, but it also has a gas engine. And so you can use the electric on like short trips. They usually have very short range, like maybe 30 miles, maybe 30 to 50. Um, and then, but then you have the gas backup. I'll say the downside of that is now you have all the moving parts of a gas car too, so you haven't really gained that advantage. Then there's the extended range ERVs. These are really interesting because they are an electric car with essentially a gas um, generator to recharge the battery. So you'll see them advertised as like an extended range EV. And I've seen that primarily with the BMW i3. They have an option for that. Then there's hybrid vehicles. So this is kind of what we've seen on the roads for you know, 20 years now, the, the Prius. We all know the Prius. So that, it doesn't plug in at all, but it does have a battery and it works together with the gas car to just, or the, the gas to make it more efficient. So you just get much better gas mileage. And so as I said, we'll just be focusing on full battery today. All right, what about cost? I think this is no, number one question everyone has because we all know they're good for the environment, but how much is it really gonna cost me? So, uh, surprisingly, you can get pretty good deals on EVs these days. So of course there are the new Teslas out there you can buy, um, but then there's, there's lots of used vehicles on the market now. So these are just three different used ones I found online that were just local, no further than Puyallup, and they are under $10,000 and they don't have a bazillion miles on them. <laughs> I think that leaf at the bottom does have about 40,000 miles on it, but you got 21,000, 14,000 for the other two. So not, not too terrible. One thing I'll mention, I'll talk about batteries later, is do watch the age of a used electric vehicle because the batteries do experience some wear and tear. And plus if it's used, you don't know how the previous owner was treating the battery. Um, and so that's like the one thing you have to think about with used EVs, but all the other components I mean, there, there's just no moving parts. There's not much to worry about. So you can get some really good de de some really good deals on used EVs. And for new and used EVs in Washington state, there is a sales tax exemption. So they do have, there's a lot of information. Um, so I would urge you to just look it up. I'll have a link later in the slides and I think this will be emailed up, out to everyone so you can check it out, but, um, the so there's caps on the cost so until the end of next year or july of next year you can get up to twenty five thousand dollars of the sales tax for lease or for used there is i think if the car is valued up to forty five thousand so they do have a cap on it um so that the higher end luxury vehicles aren't necessarily getting that exemption because the idea is we wanna make it more accessible to the average folks buying used EVs and maybe people buying the super high luxury ones might not need the tax exemption. So that was kind of the, um, that was the intent behind the way they set this up. Then there's a federal tax credit up to $75,000. So I got to use this on my EV. And the neat thing about this is um, it actually graduates down as so, as they sell certain amounts of vehicles. So 
Uh, and you'll have to go to, you'll see, this is actually on our website and there's links to see the details, but the full amount is 75,000. And then after they sell a certain amount of vehicles in the US, it goes down to 45,000. I think there's one more step down. So check the vehicle, check for the specific model eligibility. If there's one you have in mind to see what kind of tax credit you will get, but keep in mind it's out there. And I was really surprised because I have a Nissan Leaf, which I see them everywhere. So I figured, oh, they're probably expired, but I, I got the full credit two years ago. So I'm not sure where they're at now, um, but yeah, check it out. Now, I, I promised you I'd talk a little bit more about fuel costs because that's the other question I always get is, oh my gosh, is my electric bill gonna skyrocket? So I have great news for you. It's actually far less expensive to fuel an electric vehicle than a gas vehicle. Here's an example. This tool is on our website. I'll have a link at the end of the slides. Um, but so this is just comparing $3. How far will $3 get you in a gas vehicle versus an electric vehicle? And this is based on our Tacoma Powers electricity rates. So in a gas vehicle, you'll get about 24 miles. With electricity, you'll get 115 miles. So much better deal. And that equates to about three cents a mile. So if you are curious about how much more your electricity bill might go up, just think about how many miles you drive in a month and multiply it by three cents and you'll get a super rough estimate. I'll say for me, it was like 10 to $12 a month. And if I drove a lot, like there was a few times I drove to Portland and back, um, I think my bill was like, it was like 25 bucks <laughs> that month. So it's not too bad, way less than I was spending on gas. Another way you can think of this is the e-gallon. So this tool is on the Department of Energy website and it lets you choose um, the state you're in. So it, and I will just point out this uses Washington state average electricity costs and our rates are a little bit lower. Tacoma Power's rates are a little lower. So if you live in our service territory, it would be a little bit less for you. But so Washington state average, an electric car is, it's like, Fueling an electric car is the equivalent of paying 90 cents a gallon for gas. So pretty good. I think a lot of us haven't seen that cost in a long time for a gallon of gas or maybe ever. Before I keep going, do we have any questions? Um, not currently yet. Um, I just, I was gonna comment on that fact that 90 oh, yeah. cents, like when I started driving, we still had lead in our fuel, like yes. lead and unleaded, right? Um, so it was 65 cents a gallon, but you know, even looking at that straight comparison, 90 cents per gallon, like you can't get, you know, traditional fuel that at that cost ever. Like it just doesn't, exist. even at Costco, it's not that cheap. So, but yeah, it's fascinating. I think when you do that straight comparison, it really shows that you're not going to be spending that on your, you know, out of your bank account on gas, you're going to be spending it out of your household budget for electricity. And I think that's still something to, you know. Yeah. And, and I'll say too, funny thing, because I work at the utility, I have, I can go look at my own consumption. Like I can log in and look at my account. And I, I wanted to do that so I could like put a screenshot of my, my actual usage in this presentation. And the funny thing is, I couldn't see a difference. So it's not in the, it's not in the presentation because it was so minimal that you can't see it. And actually, and I don't know how, but one month I used less electricity because I was comparing the year before I got my EV to the year I got it. And I was going by month by month because that's how you have to compare your energy usage because it's seasonal and whatnot with the weather. So yeah, there was one month that like the same month, the previous year, I used more electricity. And I was like, how is that even possible? I don't even know how I did that. So when I, when I say the dollar amounts, I, I have an app on my phone and like every, pretty much every EV has some kind of app you can use. And it shows me my electricity usage, like how much electricity the car has actually used. And then you can type in your utility rate and it will tell you how much money that is. So that's what I'm using as my estimate because I can't like, can't tell on my bill because it's just mixes in <laughs> with everything else that it's not even noticeable. Um, so that's how much, so that's how I really get that dollar amount. And yeah, it ranges between like 12 to $25. Although since COVID, I haven't really been driving anywhere. Um, so that's gone way, way down, but yeah. So I thought that was interesting. And 
pretty much every EV driver I've talked to has had the same experience. Like they were waiting for that electric bill and they can't tell, like it's so small. It's just lost in the noise of, you know, the fluctuations you would normally see in your energy usage anyways. Well, and this, you know, since March, our, all our electricity bill spiked in March, of course, because suddenly everyone was home. But then, you know, I also noticed that driving my company car, the city of Tacoma car, it's a lot like, you know, this is what I've also heard. It's playing like a video game. How efficient yes. can I drive, right? So how, and so if you look at your home bill, like, well, if my, if my electronic charge for my car doesn't even show up, like, I must be doing something right. You know? Yeah. So I'll, I'll share this tidbit too. Um, we, when we were first kind of, when the utility, when we were first, Tacoma Power was first delving into EVs, we tried to like do, we always do research and try to see what other utilities are doing. And we ran across this report from this utility that had smart meters. So they can actually see energy usage by like the minute or by the interval. And they were trying to figure out which houses might have EVs by looking at usage data and they could not tell. <laughs> and they compared it to like a survey they had. Of, so they knew which households had EVs. So then they looked at the data and then they're like, okay, did we, did we get any? And they, they couldn't, it was, it was indistinguishable. So that, that was really fascinating to me. So uh, maintenance, that's the, we've talked a lot about the fuel costs. So it, it kind of just blends in with your normal electricity fluctuations. It's not a huge difference. Although I guess if you're a huge commuter, you would see a little bit more, but much less uh, gas, gas costs. So maintenance, I mentioned, got about a 10th of the moving parts. There's no oil changes. There's no serpentine belt. I've had one of those go out on me in my life and it was terrible. I never have to worry about that again no spark plugs. There's no transmission. We all know how expensive transmission troubles can be. There's no fuel tank, of course, and there's no exhaust, which is really fun. Kind of want to go to uh, get my exhaust check and just see them look for it. <laughs> just nothing there. All right. So cost of ownership. Um, it can, so they, they can be more expensive up front, the new vehicles, but um, hopefully that'll happen. I keep seeing projections of when battery prices are going to get EVs down to the same cost as gas vehicles. And that projection keeps getting shorter, which is great. So as the cost of battery comes down, the cost of the car comes down and they're going to very soon, now I'm hearing 2025 is what they're estimating or 2024 is going to be when they're about the same cost as a gas vehicle. Um, but in the meantime, there is a Washington state sales tax exemption and there is the federal tax um, credit as well. So you've got some other options. There's also used EVs available, lots of good options there. Um, but then, you know, you save so much in maintenance cost in fuel, it can really make it up. That's actually what did it for me because I started doing the math and realized, oh my gosh, I can, I can switch to a EV and, and it's fine. Like LP is saving enough to make it worth it. So I, I went with it. And, um, but one thing you do need to keep in mind is there is a road usage tax uh, that's offset in your tabs. So because you're not getting, because you're not paying fuel taxes, right? They still need to get money for roads. So they have put it in registration. So right now it's about $225 total. There's two different taxes. There's one that's 150, um, one that's 170. Five, yeah, that math works out right. Or no, 125. Yeah. Anyways, trying to do math. Yes. 75. <laughs> 75, but, thank you. But the offset is you may pay that tax right now, you know, at your registration yearly, but you're still not paying for the fuel that you would have done and the maintenance and the yeah, I've done a serpentine belt, not not fun. So no. <laughs> um now my thing is I have we have a family of six. And yes. my biggest drawback is you know, we also live in a climate where it does, we need four wheel drive. And so when are they going to make a, you know, a minivan or a, you know, a regular looking car? Cause I've always had that like, okay, it's a Prius though. It's not the greatest looking car out there. And I know it doesn't have to be flashy Corvette, but I like, you know, I drive a Land Cruiser because we need this, the power and the, and the capabilities and the, you know, the, the room. So when does that happen? That's my question. Oh, there's much, there's so many trucks and SUVs anticipated right now. Um, and I know my, my partner needs to tow, like he has a sailboat, 
and he needs to tow it. <laughs> and, and he's also like, he wants to do an electric motor on a sailboat, which is really cool. So it'll be all clean, but he needs that towing capacity. He hates that he has to use a gas truck when he's trying to be clean with his boat. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot out there we're waiting on, but there's a lot of cool stuff that looks like it's coming on the market in 2021 or 2022. There are, however, some plug-in hybrids available right now. So I know there is a Mitsubishi that is a four-wheel drive and it's a plug-in hybrid uh, and it's a little crossover SUV. And then there is also a, I'm trying to remember, oh, a Chrysler minivan as well that is a plug-in hybrid. So again, they're plug-in hybrids, so they have short ranges, but you can get that electric usage just around town. And if you need the long trips, you have it. Um, but yeah, that, that I agree. That's a challenge because we need, we need bigger vehicles. But on that note, I will mention, and Janda said I should mention this, I have a Nissan Leaf and I fit in it my six foot six partner in the passenger seat. Um, my nine-year-old son, who is, he's like up to my shoulder now and I'm five nine. So he's also very tall. And then uh, I have two dogs that are Doberman mixes. So they're pretty big. They're about 80, 90 pounds. And we went on a, a short drive recently. And yeah, the dogs were all the way in the back, like where the cargo area is. We just you take the little privacy thing off and they can stick their heads up over the seats. My son in the back seat, we had a cooler, all kinds of good stuff. So yeah, I mean, we fit a family of three and two large dogs in my little Nissan Leaf and it was totally fine. So but I will say on that note, like you definitely want to test drive the cars. Like my partner, like he can drive my car, but it's not comfortable. Like his knees are almost <laughs> hitting the, the steering wheel. But then he test drove a BMW i3 and that car looks really small to me. But he said, oh, that was super comfortable. Like I fit really well in it. So, you know, if you have concerns about the size of the car, just like any car, go test drive it and check them out and ask questions. All right. So any questions before I move on to charging? Um, I think I have one here. Uh, what about range improvements? And you might be getting to that soon. Uh, I'm a one car owner and need one with 300 plus miles. That's, I know we've talked about that before. So yes, get to that. I will talk about range in a little bit. Um, so I will address that, but yes, there are options out there for sure. So charging. Uh, I like to show this with just a regular outlet because this is literally what I used for the whole first year of my EV ownership. It was just like this. It was a charger that was like that. And I just plugged it into the wall and plugged it into my car because I was a renter. I didn't own my home, so I couldn't make changes to it. So that's all I had. And it worked great for me. Granted, I'm not a long commuter. I live in town. So that is something to think about, but it can work for people. So now what is level one, two, and three? If you've heard these phrases, level one, like I said, regular outlet can take up to 24 hours to charge your car. So keep that in mind. My car has about 150 mile range. Um, so it's actually not even mid, that's like about mid range of range available, but it's kind of, there's so many more that are 200 plus miles. It's starting to be on the lower end. Um, but what I would do is I would charge on Thursday night and then Friday night. And then by Saturday, I'd have a full battery. And then, cause I did most of my driving during the weekend going places. So level two, that is a 240 volt. So that is like a dryer plug or a stove plug. This is also what you'll find at public, most public charging stations. Um, and this takes maybe like six to eight hours, depending on your battery size to fully charge. But um, the cool thing is, again, at home, you don't necessarily have to hardwire in anything or do anything special. You can just literally use an outlet. Like if you have a dryer plug, you could use that plug. I will tell you from experience, um, if you already have the charger, make sure it works with the plug because I didn't realize my car charger was four prong and the wall charger was the three prong. So there are the three prong ones out there you can buy that I didn't know that because it came with <laughs> my car so I didn't buy it ahead of time. Sure. Um, we do have a question concerning yeah. uh, my access to even an outside outlet at my rental is very limited so I'm concerned about the barrier to EV and we you can talk about that in just a moment and then will there be more public charging stations in the future? And I think you know the question to that I'm sure. Yes so Tacoma Power actually um, has a public charging station program right now 
So we are actively working with businesses in Tacoma to build more charging stations. We also very frequently go for grants to get more charging in. I actually am running a multifamily charging program to get charging at multifamily properties. So we are working hard to get more charging in the area, but, and I'll show you a map in a minute. There's actually a ton of charging already here. I showed a friend of mine who was thinking about it. He's like, oh, I don't know. And then I showed him, he's like, I had no idea there was so much charging. Like, I think this is doable. So you can use public charging, but yeah, I agree. It can be a barrier. Um, if you have access to an outside outlet, if you can reach it, that might be a solution. If you can find a long enough cord, but if that doesn't work, there is public charging out there um, and there's and then level three charging is does give you a faster charge so you don't necessarily have to sit and leave your car for six to eight hours somewhere but um and i'll talk about this a little bit it can be hard on your battery because it charges it so fast and it creates heat and heat can be tough on a battery so it can get you about 80 percent of your battery in 30 minutes so I do recommend for level three charging, people reserve that to like long trips and they, when they, you know, they're on a long trip and they just need to stop for a moment to get a charge and keep going. Or like, you know, just in case of emergency, if you just really need more charge very quickly, then that could be a solution, but you probably wouldn't want to use that for everyday use. So charging ports. Um, so this is just a quick, and you'll get these slides later because there's a lot of information on here, but I'll just show you this J1772 right here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, it kind of looks like a little robot face, I always think, but it um, this is kind of the standard plug in North America. So you will see this on like the level one chargers that will plug into the wall. The other end looks like this and it goes into your car. And then you'll see this at public charging stations as well. So this is for the level two or the level one charge. The next one under it you see is the double. So um, I think BMW uses this. This is for faster charging. And I think BMW and Chevy use these right now off the top of my head. And then there is Chatamo. This also kind of looks like a robot to me. It looks like a robot panda, I always say. So this is fast charging only, and this is used by Nissan um, and Mitsubishi and Toyota and probably some others, but again, fast charging only. And also some older EVs do not have this. They do not have fast charging capability. So check that out as well when you're, if you're shopping used, if that is something you know you need. Um, and then there's the Tesla combo. So Tesla is different. They have their own plug. And so this plug does it all. It does um, the level two and the fast charging. Oh, and I guess the CCS, this double one does as well. It's just all one plug because you can see part of it looks like the J1772. And no, that's not an acronym. That is just literally its name. J1772 has a terrible name. I agree, but that's what it's called. So just giving you guys some a rundown of what it of what they're called and you'll have these slides later for reference but once you get an ev it doesn't feel that complicated because you know what plug you have in your car and you just look for that but at least you will see this top one all right local charging so for our friend that does not have charging at home or for those that are just concerned there might not be charging available if they're out running errands or on a trip so this is just a quick screenshot of uh our of just charging in tacoma and you can see there's a mobile a mobile app as well. So there's lots of apps out there or online resources to find charging all over. So if you're going on a trip, you can plan that ahead of time. And then, you know, once you have an EV, you kind of know, like just like with a gas car, like you have like your gas station you always go to, right? You end up like your charging station. Like we have a charging station at Tacoma Power. So if I charge at public charging, it's usually there because I'm charging when I'm at work. Um, but there's a few other places like there's a McClendon's right around the corner for me. So if I'm going there, I'll plug in there while I'm there just because it's there. So why not? Um, but yeah, so you just kind of get to know the ones in the area. And like I said, we are working hard to add more to the community. So keep a lookout for those. Our website does have a map of those. And I think we'll be announcing once we run through the program where all the new stations are, which is exciting. So what about long trips? Um, good news, there is charging 
all the way down the west coast you can actually drive all the way down to southern california when in an ev uh the west coast electric highway is a project that actually worked to make sure there's charging every 50 or 60 miles i want to say because the idea is they wanted any ev so even the smallest shortest range evs to be able to go all the way down the west coast now they're working their way towards the east coast so there's more they're trying to do more destination charging so like I saw charging at Bend, Oregon, because that is a destination people go to. So they're looking for things like that. Tesla does a lot of this too. They look for places people want to go and they'll put charging there. So something else I'll mention, I forgot to mention it during the charging, is that um, Tesla, so I, there's different connectors for Teslas and other EVs. So Teslas can use the other chargers if they have an adapter but other EVs cannot use Tesla chargers. There's no adapter for that. So keep that in mind. So if you have a Tesla, think about that. If you don't have a Tesla, just know you can't use those superchargers. They should put them in all the McMinimums, I think would be. Yes, that would be so <laughs> cool. We've actually talked about that. That would be a great place. Right, see? All right, we have a new poll time. Let's see, this is, on an average, how far do you drive in a typical car trip? Now, those of you who aren't, with a, an EV at this point in time, how far do you anticipate driving on a regular basis? I would, would guess would be a good, you know, a good question way to answer that. So, or how much well, do you drive not during a pandemic? Sure, sure, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's not today, but maybe a year ago or a year ahead from today. <laughs> I actually got a discount from my insurance company because. It, I was, it was time to renew. And I was like, you guys, I haven't, like, I go nowhere. Like, can I get a discount? <laughs> and they said, okay. <laughs> you should all ask for that. So okay, yes. Teen so teenagers who want to drive and I'm like, look, you're not going to go anywhere. Why should we start paying insurance yet? You know, like, right. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but, so pro tip, call your insurance company and say, I'm not driving anywhere. Can I have a discount, please? <laughs> Let's take a look at our uh, results. Here you go. Everyone's picked in. So not bad, six to 10 and 16 to 20. All right. Now, maybe you're gonna answer this in a little bit, but is, I mean, the idea of an electric vehicle isn't necessarily for the long, long trips. Like it's more efficient in the short, like if I'm driving 200 miles, my electric vehicle is not gonna be as efficient as it is when I'm just driving around town. Is that correct or is that? So it's, it's not so, that's a great point. So it's not so much the distance, it's the speed. Um, so interestingly enough, like, fuel efficiency. We always know there's like highway miles and there's city miles. And with a gas car, we know city miles are not as efficient. It's actually reversed for electric cars. So they're still extremely efficient, more efficient than gas cars, but they are more efficient. If you just compare electric to electric, right? They are more efficient city driving than they are highway. And that's because with stop and go driving, like in a city, you are uh, getting the regenerative braking. So the regenerative braking, an electric car is essentially using the electric motor itself to slow the car down rather than using the brakes. So that's another interesting benefit. Your brake pads last way, way longer because you're not using them as much. So the it's using the motor to slow it down and it's regenerating because it's you've you know, expended energy to move the car fast, right? And so slowing it down, it's it's using that energy to recapture and recharge the battery. So you're constantly slightly recharging the battery with stop and go. Um, with the, on the freeway, you're going fast and you're not getting the regenerative braking as much unless you're stuck in stop and go traffic, but you're not getting the regenerative braking and you have the weight of the battery and the weight of the battery is using more energy to move the car. So. That's why battery technology is so important because as they can make them lighter, um, they get more efficient and they can make them bigger. So that is what we're all kind of watching for is that battery efficiency. But yeah, so it is slightly switched, but they're still more efficient than gas cars, even on the highway. So for my friend who asked about range, the good news is range is getting better all the time. So all of you that answered how far you drive, there's definitely an EV that can work for you. There's lots of EVs that could work for you. So there's a Chevy Bolt that now gets the, now gets 259 miles of range. The Nissan Leaf Plus now gets 226 miles of range. So I got mine before they had the Plus, unfortunately, but 150 works like, I, that's plenty of range for me, really. 
Um, then there's the Tesla Model 3. So now they are up to 322 miles of range. So for those of for the one of you that said you need over 300 miles range, there you go, the Tesla Model 3. And there's lots more. So this is just a snapshot of, this isn't every EV on the market, but this is a little snapshot of them. Um, so you can kind of see down at the bar bottom, you have the smart EV there. It's like the smart car, but it's electric and it's tiny. So it has a tiny battery. So it only gets about 50 miles. Um, but you know, if all you do is drive around town, that might work for you. And then there's the Fiat 500. That's the next level up. Um, one of our interns actually had one of those and it worked great for her. So when people say, I don't know if I can afford an EV, I'm like, ah, our intern afforded had an EV. It was a fiat and you know we don't we don't pay our our interns a million dollars so she you know <laughs> she wasn't necessarily high income and she had an ev so she found she found a good used one that worked for her um and then you got your middle of the range so the nissan leaf that i showed you the chevy bolt um and then you get into the teslas the teslas are still king with range right now but you they're getting they're pushing well over 300 miles at this point So any questions on range before I talk about batteries? So I know we already had one person ask about range specifically. Nope, we're good. Okay, so batteries. I kind of give you a teaser for this. So what affects range in the battery? So we actually did our, I mentioned we're doing a EV charging study right now and we're working with this group um, to help us with the data, collect the data because, you know, we don't, we don't have the software to decode all of the software from all of the EVs, so we've contracted that out. And this, this company actually uh, does work across the US and Canada, so they have a huge pool of data. So between their data and our data, we discovered some really interesting things. So we found that in the first few years, there's about an average, um, very little battery capacity is lost. So it stays about the same. And then after that, it averages about 2% loss per year. So that's why I said, think about that when you're getting a used EV, um, because the advertised range of what the car originally got, if it's more than several years old, the range is gonna be reduced slightly. So think about that. Um, the good news, so this is the local information we've learned. We have confirmed that mild climate is good for, is very good for EVs, because we actually saw little less battery loss here locally than the national data showed. So, as I mentioned, heat or temperature extremes can be rough on a battery. We just don't have those super big temperature extremes like other areas. Um, fast charging does heat up a battery, so that, that can wear them a little bit more. But I have seen other research that has shown it's maybe not wearing them out as fast as people had originally thought. So that's kind of still, that's still up in the air, but keep it in mind. And then, Something interesting too, charging your battery when cold. So say you get home and you hang out for several hours and then you charge it, that can, that's also a little bit rough on the battery. So it's good to kind of warm it up first. And that also um, goes for, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was going to say, does using the heater in your electric car adjust like in your yes. air conditioner? Like this would be the other one. Yes. So I funny, I was just going to mention that. So using your heater and air conditioner do use up battery capacity. So, um, like I've heard of some people that are like, you know, those, the people, like you said, it's like a video game, trying to get the best efficiency they can. So they'll drive with no heat. And me, I'm a little, I'm like, no, I want to be comfortable. I want to be warm. I want to play my music. So I'm going to use all my accessories and I don't really care how much it's using. Granted, it's not that much, but it does use up a little battery because it is energy, but you're, it uses up energy in your gas car too. So that's something to think about. So now or how this can help your battery is if you um, preheat it. So a lot of EVs have a preheat mode. I know mine does. So I can, from an app on my phone, uh, pre-warm my car so I can get it up to, you know, 70 degrees on a cold day before I get in it to drive somewhere. And I didn't even realize it until I was doing that all winter that that actually helps the battery a little bit because you are pre-warming it a little bit before you go somewhere. So there are some other things you can do to kind of pre-warm it. And the great thing is you're not burning, it's not a pre-start, you're not burning exhaust like you are in a gas car. So it's just warming it up using a little bit of battery. Um, 
So the state of charge, letting the battery get very low or always charging to 100% can also be a little rough on it. So pro tip, this goes for your laptops and phones too. It's actually all of these tips too, because they're all lithium ion batteries. It's the same technology. So um, keep that in mind for any lithium ion battery technology you use. So all your phones, your laptops, pretty much all your electronics and your EV. Um, but interesting thing about EVs is manufacturers don't actually show you when they show you how much range you have, they're not actually showing you how much battery capacity you have. They have created a cushion on the top end and the bottom end. So when it says it's 100, it's not really 100. When it says it's zero, it's not really zero. I still wouldn't push it, but they've kind of done that to protect the battery a little bit. So, and, um, and also battery technology is getting better all the time. They're working on better chemistry. They already are much better than like a laptop or phone battery because they last much longer, but that's also why they're so heavy. It's different kind of, it's slightly different kind of battery of lithium ion battery, but it's getting better all the time. So every year they're improving. Um, estimates previously for old batteries were about eight to 10 years of lifetime before you may need to switch it out. And now they know they're gonna last longer, but they don't quite have estimates because we haven't got there yet, but they're thinking, you know, 10 to 15 years at least is kind of what they're thinking. So getting better all the time. All right. So any questions on battery or range or anything I've covered so far? All right, go forward. So sorry. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Just want to make sure I don't leave anyone behind. So what about environmental impact? I think that's what brings a lot of us initially to EVs. So let's let's dive into it a little bit. The great news is Tacoma Power is over 98% carbon free. And we have a lot, of, and that's because most of our electricity is generated with hydroelectricity. So it's clean, there's no emissions there. or And we have a lot of wind as well. So um, that's the good news. And in the Northwest in general, we have very clean electricity. So we're so fortunate. We have a mild climate. We have clean energy. It is like one of the best places for an EV. Now, battery life. Batteries are something to think about with environmental impact because they don't have zero impact, right? There are materials in them that have to get mined from places. But the good news is, and then they have to be disposed of at the end of their life. But the good news is there are lots of uses for EVs at the end of their life. So, like I said, they last about eight to 10 years, or at least the ones that are going out now have been around for eight to 10 years, but they still have useful life. They're still, they may not have enough power juice left in them for horsepower for a car, but they can still be used for energy storage. So there's a whole bunch of pilots right now with BMW, Hyundai, Nissan, they're all working with local utilities for energy storage to see how they can use these batteries. So that's that, and they, they can be used for another 10 years for that. So that's say 20 years of use for the battery itself. And then they recycle them at the end. So, because those materials in them are too useful not to recycle. So they're recycling them. And I know there is a push in the industry right now to make them easier to recycle. Cause that isn't, and that's really with all electronics. I'm hearing this for laptops and phones too. So keep that in mind. That is something that is on the mind of people and they're looking at and trying to figure out because it, because it is an issue. Now, this is a personal question. Is um, is it difficult to replace the battery in your EV? Like, is this something the average person can do or maybe a little more mechanic? No, so this is actually why I use this picture um, in this. Yeah, it's under everything there. <laughs> it's, this is, uh, it's right in the middle of the car. Um, so they tend to, because these batteries are so big and heavy, they tend to build the car like almost around the battery. So they're not like, I've seen YouTube videos where like engineers are replacing their own batteries and like upgrading them. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Um, but that is usually something you need to go to the manufacturer or dealer to have done. And prices can range wildly and they're changing over time. So our, uh, our fleet manager at TPU just told us this story recently they had an old battery they needed to replace. And this was like years ago, like five years ago or so they were, they were researching it. And they said it was going to be like $12,000 to replace the battery. And he's like, that's more than the car is worth now. Why would I do that? So just recently they looked at replacing a battery and it was going to be like $3,000. <laughs> and, 
And so that's, I mean, they're making progress so quickly that by the time you actually need your battery replaced, it, it could be far less than even what people are quoting now. So that is something, consider that, you know, ask your manu ask the dealer or manufacturer how much it does cost to replace this battery today. But keep in mind that may not actually be what you pay eight to 10 years when you actually do need it to be replaced. All right, so the next step, so where do you go from here? I've given you a lot of information, kind of a fire hose of information, but there's lots more out there. And you may wanna dig into more things I've mentioned that I haven't got deep into. So definitely do your research. A good place you can start is mytpu.org forward slash EVs. We have tons of information on there for you. You can learn about more EV benefits. We have an FAQ. You can learn about any upcoming events, though we're not doing a lot of events right now, but you can learn about them there when we have them. You can learn about our EV charging study. We have a savings calculator. It's a really fun. You can check out how much you might save and how much carbon you might save. So check that out. And then um, I'll have one last poll for you and then that'll be it. I'll have our resources after that. All right, here we go. Is there anything Sarah did not cover that you still have questions about? Um, and then there's three questions here. How well did this virtual workshop format work for you? And what is the most interesting and helpful topic or helpful topic that Sarah has covered? Um, go ahead and fill that out. I will say that I'm gonna um, put a link up here for the EnviroHouse workshop because you might not do any in-person events, but you'll definitely be doing a new, another uh, yes. EV here webinar in the new year. So, and we had talked about maybe a more advanced one or, um, so that's a good resource. I will also say that I'm gonna put another link for YouTube for the Tacoma, uh, for the Enviro House here. And that will give you links. You can research the, or search for the Enviro House playlist section and you'll find other webinars including this webinar from past, and then this one will be a third, and hoping eventually. All right, looks like we have some people responding. Let's go ahead and take a look at those resources, those answers, there you go. Oops, someone has questions. So we do have a little bit of time for questions, so feel free to yeah. the chat. If anyone has a question there, our, our uh, attendees, if you have a question, go ahead and put it here. And I can get it to Sarah. Maybe not. <laughs> so I also have uh, this last slide has lots of resource links. Um, of course, you can't click on it on the screen, but I believe either Gator or Janda will email these out to the participants. So you can click on them there and check them out. And you can always email me too. I'm happy to answer oh, we, questions. Good. We do have the question. Oh, perfect. are there any utility incentives for EVs at this time? That's interesting. So through the utilities. Not uh, through us. Um, so keep an eye on that though, because we're hoping, because we're hoping to be able to do that in the near future. So it's something we're still working on. Um, so yeah, keep. It might be more along the uh, the lines of charging because we're an electric utility, we provide the fuel. So it kind of makes sense to do the charging portion of it. Um, but yeah, keep an eye out for dealership deals too. Like I got mine during the Labor Day sale. Like there's always sales. Um, there's also, I know the American Public Power Association recently like partnered with a manufacturer to do a discount with them. So there's all kinds of stuff out there. So for sure, check it out. I think I'm looking for the YouTube video to make an exercise bike. That I could yes. charge my EV so I could, you know, get healthy as well as driving. You know. <laughs> I thought about that. I, I totally want to do that. I my right. my engineer partner was like, Sarah, do you know how much you'd have to pedal to generate right. enough electricity? I said, I don't <laughs> care. I'm gonna use the exercise bike bike anyway, so I might as well generate electricity while I'm right. doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, why don't we bring Janda back in here and we'll wrap up. Let's see. Uh, there you go. And um, I do want to thank you. Well, let me get that last one up there, huh? I think we just did that one, right? How, or is that oh, one yeah, we did before? do that one. Yeah, so that one's there. So Janda, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. This was awesome. Again, always great to learn and learn more information about EVs. 
Jan, I did post those links in the chat for those watching. Thank you for doing that. Um, <clears throat> so to repeat again, um, all the videos, except one that we have problems with the sound and we'll have to redo that somehow on composting. But all the other videos that we've done are um, in the Environment House Workshop page um, recorded for you to view. Um, I think we still have the fruit tree one to get up there. Um, we have some limitations as far as how many people can do the posting. So we're waiting on some of that to get done. Um, and then we also have, as I mentioned before, the um, Environment House how-to videos that are um, on one of the links that Gator just sent out for you. Um, and they have a lot of information included in there as well. So we will start our um, 2021 video or webinars in probably in February, early February, maybe the end of January, because we want to be able to get into um, fruit tree pruning and landscape pruning and things that are timely for that period. Um, we will be repeating a, the EV ones coming um, probably starting in March. We haven't set a date yet. And um, if you have suggestions on other ones that you would like to see, let us know. Um, and we'll see you next year in that and have a good Thanksgiving and be safe. Thank thanks you, Sarah. for having everyone. All right, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, have a great uh, time off. Take care, everybody. Bye.